Good morning and welcome to our our sixth lesson as we've been walking through Sinclair Ferguson's <clears throat> Devoted to God's Church. I, I'm going to be using uh, chapter six today is, is uh, under the title, Are You Hearing Me? or subtitled the Bible. And he's dealing with the, with the doctrine of the Word of God and, and how is it that Christians and churches think about the scriptures and, and apply and, and utilize the scriptures. I'm going to depart from, from his outline and, and take the occasion to, to work through uh, a couple of scripture passages and then also our confession of faith as we think through the doctrine of, of the Word of God and, and not just the, the theology of the Bible itself, but how does it work itself through and in our lives as church members and as uh, believers in Christ. Let's pray and then we'll, we'll turn our attention uh, to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Father, we thank you for your word. Uh, we thank you that it is that you have left this to us as a sure guide that when our Savior left us from, from this earth, uh, that he promised to send a comforter, to send the one who would guide us into all truth. And, and we praise you that he has fulfilled his promise, that the Holy Spirit has caused the, the very word of God to be breathed out and written down so we can study it and learn it and, and hide it in our hearts. Lord, we pray that you would bring to us um, a greater understanding of your word, uh, but not just for knowledge's sake, but that we would be convinced of our neediness before you and of the, of the perfect wisdom that your, that your word supplies to us, without which we would be left to our own uh, sinful flesh and we would be left to drift uh, without that sure guide. We thank you that we have a certain and sufficient and infallible guide for all saving knowledge. <clears throat> we thank you in Christ for this. Amen. Sinclair Ferguson asked, uh, I think, an important question as he begins the, the introduction to chapter 6. He says, it's always interesting to discover how a church thinks about itself and its basic identity. Sometimes when I have had the opportunity to speak to elders in a congregation, I've asked this question. How would you describe your church? What words would you use to express how you see yourselves? How would you summarize your identity as a church? I'll pose that question to you. When you if you're asked, and, and sometimes you are, right, in, in talking to friends and you're talking to coworkers, you're talking even to extended family members about your church, and they'll say, what kind of church is it? And, of course, we'll say something like, well, it's a Reformed Baptist church. Well, most people look at you kind of cross-eyed and say, what does that mean? What is, what is that? And what, how would you answer this? How would you describe your church? What words would you use to express how you see yourselves? How would you summarize your identity as a church? What say you? <laughs> we have a ready answer, right? A kingdom-minded, Christ-exalting, multi-generational community of faith. Yes. Yeah. And then we have to know, okay, what does it mean to be kingdom-minded? Apart from the Word of God, how do we even begin to describe that? Christ exalting. Which Christ? And what do we know about this Christ? What has he done? Uh, what has he promised yet to accomplish? So it's an important question. <clears throat> and, and I think it really, in a, in a practical way, we, some of us have talked offline about this in terms of e even with words that we use on our website. Um, many of us have, his, have, have come to the point where we, we've been in a, in a mainstream evangelical church. We had this sense of, I'm hungry. I'm not being fed. Um, I, I, there's got to be something more than this. I, I see in the scriptures something more substantial than what I'm experiencing in the life of my church. But I go to the Google search bar. What do I type in? What do I look for? Uh, I mean, conservative church, Bible-believing church. Well, most churches are going to, there's a few um, that will not claim to be conservative. They will claim to be progressive or something else. But for the most part, especially here deep in the heart of the Bible Belt, um, there, there is a, 
you, you can go into most SBC churches or most um, Bible churches, most you know conservative evangelical churches, and they would say, we're, we're, we're Bible-believing, Bible-teaching churches. What does that mean? Um, what, what can you can you actually, if if you sort of blindfolded someone, parachuted them in there, took the veil off, and said, "Okay, what's what's primary here? Would the Word of God be? Would it be obvious that the Word of God is central in the life of that of that church?" Listen to Second Timothy chapter three, <clears throat> beginning in chapter one. You know, Paul. This is in in some ways. This is this is. Has the carries the weight of Paul's last will and testament. This is Paul's final words that, that we have recorded. Uh, he's writing this to his protege. He knows that he is about to be poured out. We see this in chapter 4. I'm already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. So there's, a, there's an urgency to the apostle's words. And he says in chapter 3, But understand this, that in the last days... There will come times of difficulty. We'll stop for a moment. When, when, when did the last days arrive? After Jesus. So we are in the last days, aren't we? From the moment of his resurrection and ascension until his coming, all of that constitutes the last days. So in the last days, there will be times of difficulty. For, for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, holy, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power. Avoid such people. For among them are those who creep into households and capture weak women, burdened with sins and led astray by various passions, always learning and never able to arrive at a knowledge of the truth. The Bible true? I think it is. Uh, this certainly has characterized the last days. And, and, and we can look at history, and, and there are times when this is more so, and other times when it is less so. But it is, has always been true. Skip down to verse 14. Paul still teaching and writing to Timothy, saying, But as for you, continue in what you have learned, and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, the scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped, or furnished, for every good work. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching, for the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. But having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. We have here uh, one of the um, clearest and most direct affirmations of the doctrine of the Word of God that we have in the Word of God. The Word of God attests to its own validity, its own authority. And here, we, we, Paul makes it clear in no, certain, in no uncertain terms, all Scripture is breathed out, literally God-breathed. That is, it, it comes from the very mind of God. We know God doesn't have a body like men, so it is not that God has, has physically or audibly uh, spoken in that way, but he's, we, Peter tells us that as, as men have been carried along by the Holy Spirit, that God, through that means, breathes out his word. Every word is inspired by God immediately or directly. This word then, Paul tells us, is profitable. It's profitable for teaching, 
Uh, there's there's a, a didactic sense. There's a, a formative instruction that's given. We're told this is what the this is what the world is really like. This is what you are really like. This is what I am really like. This is what the world is really like. Um, our, our eyes will often tell us one thing. Our ears will tell us one thing. And the Word of God says, no, no, this is what's actually true. This is what's real. So it's profitable for teaching, for reproof. A reproof has the idea of, of taking something that had fallen over and setting it up right again. It, it, is, it is similar to the idea of correction that we see in the next word. But these two words together, reproof and correction, has the idea of, of changing someone's course. Of, of setting something that has fallen over and setting it up right again. And, and isn't that not only the condition of sinful men, but isn't that our ordinary daily experience as believers, where we, we in a sense, have fallen over uh, in the way that we think. Our thinking is, is, is wrong in a certain era, area, and, and the Word of God comes along and corrects us, puts us up right again. Or we are discouraged, we're depressed, we, we are in, in, a, in, a, in a pit of despair, and the Word of God comes along and sets us up right again on a firm footing. It, it reproves us, it corrects us. And then, of course, for training in righteousness. Um, and there's, a, there's a, a technical term in verse 17. It says that the man of God may be complete. And, and throughout the Old Testament, we see this term man of God uh, referring to men like Moses or Joshua. It is um, a technical term that refers to God's appointed messenger. And here, Paul's writing to Timothy, and, and not, not, as it were, the church in Ephesus is maybe looking over Timothy's shoulder, but the, the, the letter was written to Timothy, and Paul's saying, this is how you, as God's appointed messenger here in Ephesus, this is how you will be established in the truth, is by means of your faithful study and teaching of the Word of God. And by that means, Paul says in 1 Timothy, your own hearers. You will save both yourself and your own hearers. So Paul says, I charge you then. This is verse 1 of chapter 4. This solemn language, I charge you. It's basically, I put you under oath in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the Word. Be ready in season and out of season. And then here, reprove, rebuke, and exhort. Those are synonyms for what we just saw, that the Word of God is profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness. So Timothy, having been corrected and reproved and trained himself by the Word of God, is then to pass that on. But there's a chain here, because Paul had already said, it's what you have learned and firmly believed. He doesn't say what you've mined for yourself, what you have discovered of your own initiative, that's what you're to cling to. He said, no, what you've been taught. If we turn back a page in, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, Paul says, and what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, in trust of faithful men who will be able to teach others also. There's four generations envisioned in that one verse. The Apostle Paul and the Apostles teaching Timothy, and they're to teach the next generation who will be able to teach another generation after that. So it's very important, this idea of, of the Word of God uh, being foundational for everything that happens after that, for the, for the formation of the character of the man himself, but also in his ability to teach others, and then for that teaching to establish the character of those who hear by the power of the Spirit. I'm going to quote Ferguson again. He says, I know, I have known churches no one would think of as describing, or no one would think of describing as biblical, where nevertheless the Bible has been preached. So our definition must be more than just, well, the Bible is read or the Bible is, is preached in order for it to be a biblical church. Ferguson goes on. He says, a biblical church is surely one which the Bible gets out of, a biblical church is surely one in which the Bible gets out of the pulpit, as it were, and begins to move into the congregation, getting into our lives, changing us, challenging us, convicting us, and motivating us, and pointing us all to the resources of God. There's little point in guarding the pulpit if that means we are locking God's Word up inside it and refusing it entry into our life together as God's people in our individual and family lives as well. 
Sometimes such a church will be known as a teaching church, but if so, it needs to ask, what is the point of learning? For the purpose of the Bible is not merely educational, it's transformational. This is why Jesus prayed for his disciples before his crucifixion, sanctify them in the truth, your word is truth. And that comes from Jesus' high priestly prayer that John records in chapter 17. Our Lord's passion was to see the word of truth work out in lives. Of truth. So if the Bible is merely academic, if it, if it merely comes from the pulpit and it just sort of lingers in the air, it doesn't go anywhere, it doesn't produce any fruit, it doesn't produce in its hearers its intended effect, can we really say this is a biblical church? So, so the, really the, what we have to wrestle with is this idea that to be a biblical church means more than just biblical teaching, doesn't it? It means biblical hearing. It means there, there's, a, there's, a, there's an earnestness and, and an eagerness on the part of God's people to hear, to receive, and to do what the Word of God requires. So what then is the difference between a church that talks about the Bible, even teaches the Bible, and a church that is genuinely a biblical church? I'm going to direct you to 1 Thessalonians. There's a commendation that Paul gives to the, to the church at Thessalonica that I think is helpful to us. <clears> 1 <throat> Thessalonians chapter 2. Let's begin in verse 11. 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 11, he says, For you know how, like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. Now, Paul says we. We can look back at the beginning of 1 Thessalonians and see that it's Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy. There were probably others in their, their, in their party as well, but these three one apostle and, and two of his uh, protégés were the primary instructors. And, and Paul says, while we were there among you, you know this, we labored night and day like a father with his children. And notice the words that he uses. We exhorted each one of you. We encouraged you. And we charged you. So the language is very similar to what Paul said in 2 Timothy, that the word of God is profitable for teaching, for reproof, correction, and training in righteousness. Paul's, Paul's using those same concepts, those same ideas. This is what we did among you. Now listen to the commendation. Verse 13, he says, Also, we thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. For you, brothers, became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. For you suffered the same things from your own countrymen as they did from the Jews, who killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out and displeased God and opposed all mankind by hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles that they may be saved. So as always, to fill up the measure of their sins, but wrath has come upon them at last. So what is Paul saying? He commends them. He said, because when we came and talked to you, we came and preached to you, we exhorted, we encouraged, we charged you, and you didn't receive that as just our words. You didn't approach us like we were wise philosophers or good seminary professors. You said, no, this is the word of God, which means we're accountable to this. Now think back our lesson from last week. We looked at Isaiah chapter 6. And, and we were taken along with Isaiah, as it were, into the very throne room of God. And we see God high and exalted. His, his, the, the train of his robe fills the whole temp, the tabernacle. And there were cherub, uh, the, the, the seraphim were around him, covering their eyes with two of their wings, their feet with two of their wings. And they cried out constantly, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. This is the same God who speaks to us. And Paul says, you, to the Thessalonians, he said, you recognize this. I commend you because you received this, not as the words of men, but as it were, the thunderings from Sinai. You heard this as the very voice of God. And it's important that we recognize when, when we 
When, when the word of God, as the Puritans would say, when the word of God is truly preached, the voice of Christ is truly heard. It is the word of God. So what, what makes a biblical church? It's more than just biblical preaching. It can't be less than that. But it also has to be biblical hearing. It has to be those who say, I hear this as the word of God. I hear this as the one, as the one who is most holy speaking to me, the one who is most wise, the one who created and governs all things. He is the one who speaks. It is not merely the voice of a man. So what, what, do we must, what, what must we believe then about God's word in order that we are truly a biblical church? What is it we need to believe about the Bible in order that you and I are truly biblical Christians? And to help us think through this, um, I'm going to give us just a, a, a very broad survey of, of, I've traced this through in our, our study so far in a couple of different applications, but here we're going to trace through our confession the doctrine of the Word. Uh, I don't think I will get to all of this today, so I'll leave some of this to your own notes and to your own further study. But we'll start where we must start in chapter 1. And there was an interesting, if you were to sit down and write a confession of faith, if you were just going to start with a blank sheet of paper, and you're, you're going to write down, here's what I believe about God, about the Bible, about sin, and men, and angels, and the world, and how one is saved, and all those kinds of things. If you were to sit down, what would you start with? And there was a, a legitimate discussion, uh, even during the time of the Reformation. Where do we start? Because logically, we start with God, right? He's, he's, the, he's the first cause of all things. We, we start with God. In the beginning, God spoke. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. So, logically, you start with God. But what can you say about God without his word? So, we, legitimately, you can make an argument that in our, our confession of faith, and we follow the Westminster Confession and the Savoy Declaration and, and other Reformed confessions that start with the doctrine of God's word. That's the very first chapter. A legitimate argument could be made, logically, that you would start with the doctrine of God, theology proper. That's chapter 2 in our confession. But some have asked, and I think it's a legitimate question, why is the, the Bible chapter 1 and, and God isn't until chapter 2? Well, that's why. Because what we know of God, um, we, we can know his, his invisible attributes. Roman one, Romans 1 tells us that. But we cannot know that God is triune, that he has a son by, by whose name we must be saved, unless we have God's special revelation. So we'll start with the Holy Scriptures, which is chapter 1. And again, I'm going to go through this at, at a, fasten your seatbelts, this will be a, a breakneck speed. But I want to give just a, a survey of some of these, these ideas here, because we're, we're working with the question, what is a biblical church? And what must we believe about the Scriptures in order for us corporately to be a biblical church, but also for us individuals to be biblical Christians? Paragraph 1, the, our, our Baptist forefathers added a very important statement uh, that the other confessions did not have. They don't deny this by any stretch, but, but our Baptist forefathers wanted to be crystal clear from the very beginning. The Holy Scripture is the only sufficient, certain, and infallible rule of all saving knowledge, faith, and obedience. Um, and, and once again, you can find a, a, follow along with what I'm reading in the back of the hymnal. Um, somewhere around page 665, 670, somewhere in there. 670, okay. So, the Holy Scripture is the only sufficient, certain, and infallible rule of all saving knowledge, faith, and obedience. It does not say the Scriptures are our only authority or that we can learn nothing of the world except by the Scriptures. But there's an important qualifier. The Scripture is the only sufficient, certain, and infallible rule. The very next statement, and this is where the Westminster Confession begins, although the light of nature and the works of creation and providence do so far manifest the goodness, wisdom, and power of God as to leave men inexcusable, yet they are not sufficient to give that knowledge of God and his will which is necessary unto salvation. 
So in other words, the works of creation, we can, we can stand out on, on, on the top of a mountain and view the world that God has made. We can lay on our back on, on, a, on a cool spring night and look up and see the stars in the heaven and see the glory of God. We, we can see his handiwork and we can come to the conclusion that there is a God. and There's a good God. But that's only enough to leave us inexcusable. It's only enough to condemn us. It's not enough to save us. We need God's special revelation in order to give us that. So what our confession asserts is that we have two, we, God has given us two books. The book of nature, natural revelation, but also the Bible, his special revelation. One of those, and only one of those, is sufficient, certain, and infallible. The other is not. Therefore, it pleased the Lord at sundry times and in diverse manners to reveal himself and to declare that his will unto his church. And afterward, for the better preserving and propagating of the truth and for the more sure establishment and comfort of the church against the corruption of the flesh and the malice of Satan and of the world, to commit the same wholly unto writing, which makes the Holy Scripture to be most necessary those former ways of God revealing his will unto his people being now ceased. Some important things that we confess in the very first chapter, and that is, one, the two books that God has given to us, but only one of which is sufficient, certain, and infallible. The other thing that we learn is that God in his providence has caused the word of God to be written down. And the entirety of God's special revelation that he intended for men to have is recorded in the Bible. Now we know from the testimony of John, for example, the, the Apostle John, that if, if all the actions and all the words of Jesus were to be written down, the whole world couldn't hold them, right? So we know that the, the Bible doesn't tell us everything that's possible for us to know about God, but everything he intended for us to know in a comprehensive manner, a sufficient manner, has been recorded for us. But there's another important thing, is because God has done this, the former ways of God's revealing himself unto his people has now ceased. What do you think it means when it says those former ways? What are some of the former ways of God revealing himself to his people? Prophets, okay. What else? Immediate revelation? Angels? What else? Dreams, visions, um, various ways that God has spoken to his people. Um, and all the things that you've, you've just said are exactly right. All those ways, we can go to the Old Testament and we can find that God has done all of those things at various times and in sundry manners, to use the same language. But all those things having now ceased. Why? Because the word of God is given to us in completion. There is no longer a need for an angel to come and speak to me or to speak to you. Uh, there's, there's no longer a need for, for the Spirit of God immediately, meaning directly, to speak to his people because he does so through his word. So in order to be a biblical church, we need to understand, first of all, what, what God has taught us about his own word. Then as we continue through our, our confession here in chapter 1, again, I'm going to go pretty quickly. Paragraph 2 just simply says, this, this enumerates which books of the Old and New Testament, the 66 books of the Old and New Testament that we have received as given by inspiration of God to be a certain, sufficient, and infallible rule of faith and life. Because remember, all Scripture is profitable. But we can't say that about things that are not Scripture. So that's the third paragraph, the books commonly called the Apocrypha. So if you have a Roman Catholic Bible, there will be extra books in there that we don't believe are inspired by God. And so we don't give them any other, it doesn't mean that we throw them out and, never, and, and that it's a sin to read them. And there are other apocryphal books that are not, con, not contained in the Roman Catholic Bible. There are other Gospels, there are other historical accounts, but we would treat them no differently than we would any other historical record. We have, to, we have to read those things with an understanding that this is not the Word of God. This is not infallible. This is not certain. And this is not sufficient. It may have historical clues that could be helpful, just as we would maybe read an ancient historian like uh, Josephus. 
And he gives an account of, for example, the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70. Well, it's not scripture, but we could say some of these things might be helpful for us to get a background of what's going on and from a, that his first-hand historic account. But they are not scripture. Then paragraph 4 says, the, the authority of the Holy Scripture for which it ought to be believed depends not upon the testimony of any man or church, but wholly upon God, who is truth itself, the author thereof. Therefore, it is to be received because it is the Word of God. So we don't believe the Word of God because somebody told us to believe it. We don't believe that this is the Word of God because your pastor said this is the Word of God. Or because your parents said this is the Word of God. It's because the Word of God says it's the Word of God. That's why we believe it to be, to be such. Then paragraph 5, uh, there, there are some uh, an amazing things that are, that are articulated here. He says, our, our fathers confess this, and, and, and we agree with this. We may be moved and induced by the testimony of the church of God to a high and reverent esteem of the Holy Scriptures. That's legitimate to say that the church testifies throughout the ages that the Word of God really is the Word of God. And the heavenliness of the matter. So the, the heavenliness of the things that we read in the Scriptures also give evidence that it is the Word of God. The efficacy of the doctrine, meaning we can read through, for example, the Proverbs, and we can see the, the wisdom and the advice given there, and we say, this makes a lot of sense. This must be the Word of God. The majesty of the style. As we read through the, all the various genres in the scripture, we say, well, this, is, this is amazing. Uh, I, I was amazed teaching through the Gospel of Matthew how uh, not only is it the Word of God, but it is amazing literature. I mean, for, for a, a former tax collector, an uneducated man, to write the things that he wrote in the style and in the literary prose and, and the, the, the skill that's there, there's a majesty to it. The consent of all the parts, meaning there's not one contradiction. From, from Genesis all the way to Revelation, all those books, 66 books by all those different authors, and they all agree together. And the scope of the whole, and that word scope, uh, in, in the older use of the language, think of it more like a rifle scope. Sometimes we think of the scope of something, we're thinking more of its broad panoramic view. But they had in mind something more narrow. What's the scope of the whole Bible? What's the narrow focus of the entire Bible? Jesus Christ himself, isn't it? From Genesis 3.15 all the way to the very end, in the last two verses of the book of, Re of the Revelation, Christ is the focus. He is the scope of the whole. Okay, So all those things... Um, which is to give glory to God, the full discovery it makes of the only way of man's salvation, and many other incomparable excellencies and entire perfections thereof, or arguments whereby it doth abundantly evidence itself, it, evidence itself to be the word of God. So all those things we can, we can put in a ledger and say, all these are compelling evidences that this is the scripture. But, Yet notwithstanding, our full persuasion and assurance of the infallible truth and divine authority thereof is from the inward work of the Holy Spirit bearing witness by and with the word in our hearts. So in other words, all those things, we, we would say, all of them point to the fact that this is the word of God. Legitimately so, but ultimately and finally, the full assurance that we have that this is the word of God is that inward work of the Spirit testifying to us, this is the word of God. This is true, this is right, which is why those in Thessalonica were able to receive this as really the Word of God, not merely the testimonies of men. Paragraph 6 asserts to us what we would call the doctrine of the sufficiency of Scripture. Again, Scripture doesn't tell us everything that we could possibly know about God or about the world, but it tells us everything that we need to know the whole counsel of God concerning all things necessary for his own glory, man's salvation, faith, and life is either expressly set down or necessarily contained in the Holy Scripture, under which nothing at any time is to be added, whether by new revelation of the Spirit or traditions of men. Nevertheless, we acknowledge the inward illumination of the Spirit of God to be necessary for the saving understanding of such things as 
as are revealed in the Word, and that there are some circumstances concerning the worship of God, the government of the church, common to human actions and societies which are to be ordered by the light of nature and Christian prudence, according to the general rules of the Word which are always to be observed. So again, we have this idea of the inward illumination of the Spirit being necessary for us genuinely and fully to understand the Scriptures. Now, I'm going to give you an example here, negatively speaking. Um, who's familiar with the, with the Church of Christ, the Churches of Christ, formerly the Disciples of Christ? Are you familiar with, not, they wouldn't say they're a denomination, um, but they function in, in similar ways. Tom, you're familiar with one of the things that the churches of Christ will do is they, they profess to be a very biblical church. Um, they, they will say that everything is about Bible study. And that, but from their founders, and you'll hear the term Campbellite sometimes, in, in the mid-19th century, when the disciples of Christ began to, to, to grow and propagate, one of the, the foundational features of their understanding of the Scriptures is that even a natural man, can sit and read the scriptures just like he would read a newspaper and come to a full understanding of it. And they believe that if you gave people the Word of God, he put 100 people in a room and he gave them each a copy of the scriptures and told them to read a certain section, that all of them would come away with the same conclusion if they studied it honestly. If they came in with the sort of blank slate and studied it without any preconceived ideas, this is, these are the things that they would come away with. Well, there's a couple problems with that. Number one is, can you ever read the scriptures without having any preconceived ideas? It's impossible. But secondly, the Scripture is very clear that we need the Holy Spirit in order for us to understand rightly and fully the Word of God. We are dependent upon the inward work, that illuminating work, which is why um, if, if I neglect to do it, it's, it's merely an oversight. I normally pray every week before the preaching, that God would give us illumination, that God would send His Spirit to help us understand what we're hearing, but not only to understand it, but, but to believe it, to be convicted of our sin, to apply this to our lives and walk faithfully before our God. We need the Spirit of God in order to do that. Our mere human faculties are not enough. When we are reading and hearing the Word of God, we are interacting with the infinite mind of God. Do we think that just our bare human intellect is sufficient to understand that? No, it's not. So we need the inspiration of the Spirit. Now, go ahead. as if it's merely literature. Right. Yes. There's something else in this paragraph that's, that's, uh, that's helpful to us to think about. <clears throat> there are some circumstances concerning the worship of God and the government of the church, common to human actions and societies, which are to be ordered by the light of nature. So, for example, what, what time should we start worship on a Sunday? How about 4 a.m.? Who's up for that? Who's up for a 4 a.m.? Well, the light of nature and Christian prudence would tell us that's not the ideal time to have a worship service, isn't it? Uh, you, might want, you may occasionally want to have a, a sunrise service or something, but generally speaking, our, our, our bodies are more alert and more able to receive the Word of God at a, a, a time when we're able to get our families ready, get the kids actually out of bed and dressed and not be in their pajamas for worship and, and be somewhat awake, Right? So there are things that, that, and that's maybe a silly example, but, but it's a real one. Or should we have chairs or pews? Should, should we have a, a microphone system and, and a um, powered electronics, or should we just go GFBC unplugged? Those are, those are things that, that the light of nature and Christian prudence uh, are decisions that we make, always governed by the general rules of the Word of God and Christian prudence. We might even call this sanctified common sense. I've heard many use that term, sanctified common sense. Now, notice, and we'll, 
we're not going to get to this today, I can, I can tell you. But if, we, if you were to jump ahead to chapter 22, which deals with worship, and to see how the Word of God shapes our worship, there's a distinction between elements of worship and circumstances of worship. Who can give me an example of an element of worship? What would be an element of worship? Singing is an element of worship. What else is an element of worship? Reading the Scriptures. Yeah. Yeah. Confessing what we believe. Prayer. Uh, preaching the Word of God. Um, the Lord's Supper. Baptism. Those are elements of a worship service. Those are not negotiable. God has given those to us. We are not to add or subtract from those. But then there are circumstances of worship that are different. What time do we start? How long is our service going to be? Do we sing three hymns or do we sing 20 hymns? Those are circumstances of worship. That we sing is an element of worship. How many songs we sing or what particular hymn we sing this Lord's Day is a circumstance of worship. And, and those we are to govern by the, the, uh, the light of Christian prudence and the general rules of the scriptures. Paragraph 7 in chapter 1 gives us, we, we, we saw in the previous paragraph, the doctrine of sufficiency. The scripture tells us enough to be saved. But there's another doctrine that's important. You might, have you ever heard the term perspicuity? It means, it's, it's a fancy theological word. It just means the doctrine of the clarity of the scriptures. And, there's, and I mentioned the churches of Christ earlier, not to pick on them, but, but to give a contrast because they have willfully departed from a, a reformed and, and orthodox heritage in this area on that doctrine of sufficiency, but also on the doctrine of clarity. We, look, look what it says. All things in Scripture are not alike plain in themselves. Now, if you've read the Bible, if you've read even part, large parts of the Bible, you know this is true, right? Sometimes you can read something. Uh, you can read a narrative portion, for example, and you know exactly what happened. Abraham and Sarah did this, and this happened next, and it's, it's really plain, really clear. Uh, uh, a new reader, elementary school age new reader, can read that and understand very clearly and tell you, Mom, this is what happened in the story. Okay. Then you get into Hebrews or Romans or the prophets or the book of the Revelation. And you've been a Christian for 10 and 20 years and you're reading through this and say, I'm not sure I understand this. That's because not every section of Scripture is, is equally plain. Now the Apostle, uh, Apostle Peter Remember, he says this, he said, there's things about Paul's writings that are hard to understand, right? And Peter is, is articulating, there are other scriptures, some things are hard to understand. This is the doctrine of perspicuity, the doctrine of clarity. Not all passages of scripture are equally plain, nor alike clear unto all, meaning there are those by virtue of gifting or experience or training will have a better grasp on certain passages than I do, or than you do. So the, the, we don't say that the scripture is like reading a newspaper, where everyone can understand it equally, and every part of it is equally understood. Yet, and here's an important but, or yet, those things which are necessary to be known, believed, and observed for salvation are so clearly propounded and opened in some place of scripture, excuse me, or another, that not only the learned, but unlearned in the due use of ordinary means may attain to a sufficient understanding of them. Now what do you believe, and this is again, we're, we're using older language here, but what do you think they mean by learned and unlearned? It, it's, even, it's even a finer point than that. There's certainly that, but it's those who are literate, those who could read and write, and those who can't read and write. So let's say, let's say you're a, an Ephesian farmer in the first century. You've, you've never been able to read and write. And now, here the gospel of Jesus Christ comes to your village, comes to your town. Uh, you, you, you heard this, this guy Paul down at the synagogue. Um, you, you've, you've showed up several weeks in a row now and hearing what he's saying makes sense to you. The Spirit of God is at work in you, but you can't read, you can't write. You've not been formally trained. Can you really become a Christian? And not only that, can you become a mature Christian? The answer is yes, you can. Yes, you can. 
the learned and the unlearned in the due use of ordinary means. Meaning, do you show up when the Word of God is being read out loud, when the Word of God is being proclaimed and preached, when the people of God are gathered together to discuss the things of God, are you there? And even those who could not read or write, which ought to be an encouragement to, to those who have young children, even before they're able to, to, to read and write and understand the Scriptures, we, we, we might underestimate their ability to understand spiritual things. It's one of the reasons that we have our children with us in worship. Rather than, than sequestering them in a nursery or children's church until a time we think, well, they're, now they're really ready. Well, now they've been conditioned, uh, their appetites have been conditioned for entertainment and play and other things. Rather than saying, no, even at a very young age, they, begin, they can begin to understand the things of God. And even if they are not able yet to read and write, they may attain to a sufficient understanding so you don't need to have three PhDs in Old Testament theology in order to understand the gospel, do you? It might help you um, in, in, in certain aspects, but it's not necessary for you to become a Christian or even a mature Christian. Paragraph 8 speaks of God's special providential care of preserving his scripture. The Old Testament was originally written in Hebrew, the New Testament written in Greek, and that we, we encourage and support various translations. You'll see the language here, uh, therefore they are to be translated because we recognize that most of us don't speak Hebrew. Most of us are not fluent in Greek. And that's, that's the reality in any generation uh, after the time of the Bible. Therefore, they ought to be translated. And the, and the language used here is they are translated into the vulgar language. Again, this is old, sort of quaint, 17th century wording. The vulgar language just means the common language. The common language. So we are not, for example, a King James only, or a, we only, that we would only use one particular translation. We recognize that only the Old Testament in Hebrew and the New Testament in Greek is actually infallible. So we, we recognize that we're, we're, we're working with translations. We always want to be able to refer back to those originals, knowing that that is, um, that is the Word of God, the Word of God dwelling plentifully in all. Uh, the people of God may worship Him in an acceptable manner and through patience and comfort of the Scriptures may have hope. The final two paragraphs... Um, give us some, some understanding of how we are to think about interpreting the Scriptures. Uh, we know that we need the illumination, the inward illumination of the Spirit of God. Paragraph 9 says, The infallible rule of interpretation of Scripture is the Scripture itself. And therefore, when there is a question about the true and full sense of any Scripture, which is not manifold but one, it must be searched by other places that speak more clearly. So, and you've had this experience. You're reading along, and you, you find a passage, and, wow, this is, I'm not sure I fully understand this. Or, does this passage tell me everything I need to know? And I'll give you an example. We've been working through Colossians 3. And we get to Colossians 3, verses 18 and 19. It says, wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Well, is that all the Bible says about a wife's role? No. We go to other passages that expand upon that, and maybe say it more clearly. In this, by the same token, today's text, husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh or bitter towards them. Well, is that all that the Scripture says? Well, no. We can turn, for example, to Ephesians 5, and we will, where there's much more given to us. Or 1 Peter 3. We can, we can look at a number of parallel passages. So the infallible rule of interpreting Scripture, what does it mean for a husband, for example, to love his wife? Well, it's not up to me to decide that or for you to decide that. We go to other passages of Scripture that explain that more fully and more clearly. And therefore, when there is a question about the true and full sense of any Scripture, which is not manifold, meaning no Scripture has two meanings, or two, two different meanings, it must be searched out by other places that speak more clearly. And lastly, paragraph 10 says, The Supreme Judge, 
by which all controversies of religion are to be determined. And all decrees of councils, opinions of ancient writers, doctrines of men, and private spirits are to be examined, and in whose sentence we are to rest can be no other but the Holy Scripture delivered by the Spirit, into which Scripture so delivered, our faith is finally resolved. So we begin this chapter with a statement that the Word of God is the only sufficient, certain, and infallible guide. We end this paragraph, or this chapter, with a statement that basically repeats that one. That even our creeds, our confessions, our counsels, none of those are infallible. And any controversy we have, ultimately, is to be decided by the Word of God. Not by our own private interpretation, not by doctrines of men, not by private spirits, meaning, well, God told me it means this. Well, that's not, no, that doesn't count. We are to, to search the Scriptures themselves uh, to determine the final meaning. I didn't get as far as I had hoped to get today. What I'm going to do, um, we're going to have a part two. We'll come back. Not next week. Next week we won't have Sunday school. Uh, the, the Sunday after Thanksgiving, I know that some will be traveling, so we won't have it next week. Also, if you want to go and make a note, on the 25th of Dece- or 26th of December, the day after Christmas, and the 2nd of January, uh, we'll also not have Sunday school. Worship, same schedule, worship, fellowship meal, but not Sunday school those, those days. So we'll put a pin here, um, and we'll come back, because there's some other things that, that I want to be able to work through. I think this is an important question, as we think about our life together as, as an assembly. What does it mean to be a biblical church? What, what do we believe about the Scriptures? Chapter 1 sets the tone for the rest of our confession, but I want, I want to show you how that weaves its way through in various places, so that we understand how the doctrine of the Word, for example, affects um, the covenant relationship of, of Christ as our mediator, how the Word of God shapes our, our understanding of justification, of sanctification, of conversion, of worship, of our liberty of conscience. So we'll, we'll work through those other things um, week after, week after next. Let's pray together. Father, you are a good and gracious God. We thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you that we we will spend all of our lives and never reach the depths of what you have revealed to us. Indeed, we will spend all of eternity uh, praising you that your mercies are new every morning. We thank you that you are a well who is inexhaustible that your goodness, your mercy, your grace to your people will never run dry. Thank you for your word, which is our certain, sufficient, and infallible rule. We bless you in the name of your Son. Amen.